know, one woman was saying, I have never made more money in my life than I do today, but I'm more poor. What is going on? How do I, like this woman is like, how do I make $90,000 a year and I'm still living paycheck to paycheck? A family of four, paycheck to paycheck. They print money, they debase your labor, it demoralizes the whole society. And people are just confused. I wrote the Bible in Bitcoin for you, Bible-believing Christian, and in it I lay out the biblical basis for what money is, why our current fiat monetary system is ungodly, and how Bitcoin is the best and most viable, biblically compliant replacement for government fiat money. There's even a small group study guide in the back with additional resources to study with your church small group. Get it on Amazon or pay with Bitcoin at thebibleandbitcoin.com for a discount. So, Christian in the room tonight, I want you to know God is doing an amazing work in you. Amen? He's transforming you into the likeness of Christ. He's giving you new affections. He's giving you a new heart. The sin you once loved, you now hate. And for many of us, he's freed us from addictions repaired broken relationships, given us joy and purpose that, you know, oftentimes in my life I wonder how I lived without it all those years. And we oppose all manner of societal rot. We oppose child sacrifice. We oppose the, <clears throat> let me get my monocle on, 2SLGBTQAI+. Alphabet soup community of perversion, especially of children. We support family values and we, we try to live an honorable and, and, and generous life. But there is an insidious, evil elephant in the room. And we've ignored this fat elephant for far too long. It's gone unnoticed among Christians for far too long. And that elephant has a giant dollar sign on its forehead. And this elephant has been plundering and robbing and devaluing your time and your energy for a very long time. Our monetary system, our central banks are operating on an ungodly rule set. If you want to think about fiat money as a software, the code of said software is quite literally demonic code. So I wrote this book, The Bible and Bitcoin, to Lord willing get Christians to begin to understand the pernicious evil of fiat money and to start to look at the very surprising yet viable solution that Bitcoin offers to this problem. Now, I, I say that to a, lot, to, to a lot of Christians, and they look at me like I'm crazy. Alan, don't you know the love of money is the root of all evil? Oh, thanks, I didn't know that. Forgot, no, of course I know that. That's not what we're talking about. Alan, don't you, don't you know that Talking about money is worldly and you shouldn't do that. To illustrate the importance of honest money, I'd like to share a story about Jesus to show you how he felt about monetary policy. The story is found in Mark chapter 11, verse 15 to 18. Whether you're a Christian or not tonight, I think you're familiar with this story. I'm going to read it anyways. It says, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And, we, and he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking excuse me, for a way to kill him. Boy, that escalated quickly. <laughs> for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Most important question you'll ever be asked, 
I will ask right now. Who is Jesus? The thing about Jesus is everyone has an opinion about who he is. If I were to ask every single person in this room who is Jesus, I probably would get quite a few different answers. And for some reason, people think they can just make Jesus whoever they want him to be, right? I mean, think about that for a second. Think about the entitlement one must have to think they can define someone else according to their own imagination. We don't treat anybody else like this, only Jesus. Case in point, think of other historical figures. You would never treat them this way. Let me ask you, who's Michael Jordan? Who is he? He's a basketball player. Anybody disagree? No, no, no one? Okay, cool. What if I said Michael Jordan was a Hispanic woman who was famous for writing country music in the 60s? You would rightly call me a lunatic. But come on, who are you to judge, right? This is the Michael Jordan that I have a personal relationship with. You can't define my Michael Jordan. It's madness. You don't do this with any other historical figure. No, Michael Jordan was a black man who was famous for playing basketball in the 80s, in the 90s, and we'll forget about the two seasons in the 2000s. Because those, let's forget about those. He's a Chicago Bull and that's it. You can't just make up your own Michael Jordan. You can't say he is who I want him to be. But yet we do this with Jesus, and some say he's a good teacher. Some say he, he never did miracles. It was just made up. Some say he was just a misunderstood guy. He probably never existed. Well, which is it? Is he misunderstood, or did he never exist? Yet here in this passage, we see a side of Jesus that many would rather not deal with. A lot of people in the church, they don't want, they don't want to talk about this Jesus. He enters the temple in Jerusalem, and he goes on a rampage. Like a bull in a china shop, he starts chasing people out, turning the tables over, and driving out those who sold money and throwing coins everywhere. There's this one movie, I forget which one it is, Jesus movie, where it depicts this scene, and it's the softest depiction. I don't know if you've seen this movie, but he kind of like, I have nothing to flip here. Uh, maybe I'll use a chair. What he does. He goes in the temple and he goes, What's going on here? Get out! <laughs> Seriously, that's what he does in the movie. It's brutal. And I'm like, really? He like shoves one table over. It's really soft and sort of soy induced uh, rampage in that movie. But that's not what happened in real life. In real life, he went. Crazy! He starts flipping tables. He starts throwing money. He's he, in one passage you talk about. He makes a, a whip of cords, and there's debate among scholars: Did he actually whip them, or did he just sort of brandish it? I don't know. But he didn't go in there and say, "Oh, please, sirs, would you kindly take your money tables and exit the temple?" That's not what he did. He was physically imposing. He took them, he flipped them. And this is the only episode we see in the life of Jesus, outside the book of Revelation, of course, where Jesus seems to explode with rage and get physical. So then, what causes the Son of God to explode with rage and get physical? This should cause our ears to prick up. What, what was it? Three words. Sinful monetary policy. And that's telling. Sinful monetary policy caused him to explode in this manner, not something we should gloss over. Now, some might say it wasn't sinful monetary policy. It was the merchants buying and selling in the temple. But the simple act of buying and selling in the temple was not a sin. As a matter of fact, it was quite the opposite. God actually commanded the buying and selling in the temple. Did you know that? No, nobody knew that. Okay. 
Deuteronomy 14 says, If the way is too long for you so that you're not able to carry the tithe when the Lord your God blesses you because the place is too far uh, from you, which the Lord your God chooses to set his name there, then you shall turn it into money and bind up the money in your hand and go to the place that the Lord your God chooses and spend the money for whatever you desire, oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink, whatever your appetite craves. And you shall eat there before the Lord your God and rejoice, you and your household. God told the people, when I build this place where my name is going to dwell, which ended up being Jerusalem, if it's too far from you, to carry your animals and your offerings, if it's too far, sell those things for money. When you get to the temple, buy those things and then worship. So God actually commands the people to buy the offerings for the temple service. So it's not the buying and selling that's the problem here. It can't be. God told them to do it. This was God's solution. To the problem of incoming travelers into the city who've come to worship. So then, what makes Jesus so angry? Why, why was he so mad? Because there was fraud, manipulation, and sinful monetary policy being enacted. So what was happening in the temple was not an honest commerce. Look at Jesus' teaching that day in the temple. He says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. What is prayer? Communication with God. The temple was a place where God dwelt and worshipers traveled to worship to offer sacrifices and to communicate with God. But rather than aiding in that communication, in that relationship with God, these merchants had made the temple a den of robbers. Robbers being the key word here. Notice Jesus doesn't say you've made it a den of buying and selling. Because buying and selling was not the problem. The problem was the sinful monetary policy. The merchants were robbing people. How? By selling the offerings with an unreasonable margin. Prices were inflated. These merchants saw this as an opportunity to gouge the people. So if someone sold a lamb, let's say, for one piece of silver at home, and they traveled to Jerusalem, the, the, the lamb now costs two pieces of silver. And, and that now they're stuck. Well, what do you do? You're here to worship. You're here to offer your sacrifice to worship God. But the merchants have jacked up the price on the way there. Well, now I can't worship. Now I can't offer sacrifice because I don't have enough. Unless you're rich. But worse than that, what they were doing with this scam was actually pricing out the poor from worship. They were saying only the rich can worship. The poor, you're priced out. The house of prayer was turned into a den of robbers because the poor were now priced out, excluded. And you can understand how this might infuriate God. Uh, now God would not receive the worship he's due because these thieves are gouging the people. They're running a racket in the temple. That can't be. So Jesus' blood, his holy blood, begins to boil, and he flips the tables over, and he takes the prophets, and he tosses them to the wind. Why? Because sinful monetary policy, which broods up in a pool of greed. And out of greed comes these scams. And the Pharisees and the religious rulers, who profited greatly, by the way, through this religious racket— we're not happy with Jesus because he did these things and was gaining popularity with the people. And so they devised a plan to kill him. So the question of whether Christians should care about Bitcoin, I think, is the wrong question. I think the right question is, should Christians care about monetary policy? Or even better, did Jesus care about monetary policy? It's clear from the broken tables and the scattered coins on the temple floor, the answer is yes, he did care, profoundly. Jesus said the temple was a house of prayer, or as it was supposed to be. But is that the only place he desires a house of prayer? Does it end in that temple, which isn't even there anymore? What was the point? Jesus said, my body is the temple, and on, in three days I will raise it back up. 
And when you believe in the Lord, you join his body, and now you become the temple of the Holy Spirit. So fast forward now to the end of history, and what do you see? The entire world becomes the temple city of God. And the truth of Jesus' mission was that he came to make all things new. To take a world that's mired in sin and darkness and corruption, is it not? Of course. And to transform it into a house of prayer for all nations. So extrapolate that out and you'll see God's monetary policy is very simple. You shall not steal. Why should Christians care about Bitcoin? Because the alternative monetary network that we have, the one we live in now, is predicated and operated on theft. God says you shall not steal, and the whole monetary system of the Bank of Canada is literally predicated on stealing. This is a no-brainer, guys. I don't know what's so controversial about this. Governments of the world put themselves in the place of God and decree money into existence. How can they do that? How do you reap value where no one has sown? With the threat of violence. That's how. Use my money or else. Have you considered that? The government has decreed the money you must use then they take that created money that they made, and what they do, out of nothing, and what they do with that is they build these big cages, and then they hire men, and, and, and even now women, with guns to enforce it, and they say, use our money or else we will put you in the cage. Does that sound like a fair and honest monetary network? No, it doesn't. It sounds like thugs. It sounds like... The organization with the monopoly on violence makes the money. So I know I said the dollar is not backed by anything, but it is. It's backed with bullets. It's backed with violence. Then they print more of that money and debase your labor, which, by the way, your labor is your time and your energy. There's something profoundly evil, which is why I think God talks about this in the Old Testament and course in the New Testament. He talks about it throughout history. You, you shall have just and fair measures. I think the reason he talks about that is because there's something profoundly evil about debasing someone's labor. When you debase the money a, a, a person works for, what you're really doing is debasing them. Because that's their energy. That's their contribution to the world. And you debase that. And it's profoundly demoralizing. Those closest to this money printer enrich themselves, while those furthest from the money printer become poorer and poorer and poorer. Before I walked in this building, I was watching a video on Twitter. I will not call it X, Elon, not doing it. It's Twitter forever. Unless I start getting those big commissions, then I might call it X, but anyways. <laughs> I was watching a video on Twitter, and it was, about four minutes long of back to back to back to back to back videos of people in Canada mostly lamenting how they got two jobs. You know, one woman was saying, I have never made more money in my life than I do today, but I'm more poor. What is going on? How do I, like this woman is like, how do I make $90,000 a year and I'm still living paycheck to paycheck a family of four paycheck to paycheck how is this pot well maybe because you're living in toronto probably but <laughs> the fact remains they print money they debase your labor it demoralizes the whole society and people are just confused and not only does it impoverish you it it takes the bill and gives it to the future. It, money printing impoverishes you now and it impoverishes your children in the future. Profoundly evil, profoundly wicked. There's a king in the Old Testament, I uh, forget his name, but uh, the prophet came to him and said, listen, king, it's going to be good in your days. 
You're going to have safety and peace and prosperity. But just so you know, your sons will be taken away to his foreign land as eunuchs. And the king, this is how he responded. He said, the word of the Lord is good, for there will be prosperity in my days. Bro, did you miss the part where your sons will be slaves? How, how wicked do you have to be to hear that your sons will become eunuchs, which, if you don't know what they do to them, <laughs> right? A little gender reassignment surgery, if you will. How can you hear that? You're, if the prophet came to me and said, Alan, you're going to be rich and prosperous, but your sons are going to be eunuchs and slaves in a foreign land, I would say, Lord, please let there be chaos in my day and let there be peace in their day. But this wicked man says, oh, good. It's going to be fine with me. I'll die. Then my sons will have their testicles chopped off and they'll be slaves in a foreign land. It's all good. This is, this is the fiat money paradigm. Who cares if my children are poor and struggle and they can't afford a house and their uh, 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 time and energy is devalued so long as I'm okay? This is sort of the boomer mindset, if, if, if you can receive that. <laughs> Fiat money is debt and it's operating on a software predicated on thefts. And God commands us to use a fair and just measure and fiat money is not that. So I'll leave you with this. Bitcoin is the world's most fair, honest, and just monetary networks human beings have ever had. The rules of Bitcoin are set in code. No one can alter or change its fundamental properties. No one can create more Bitcoins. There's only 21 million. Well, probably far less than that because of lost coins and so forth. Theoretically, there's only 21 million. No one can confiscate your Bitcoin by freezing your accounts, right? Trudeau can't just make a decree to the CIBC and the TD whatever trust and say, hey, freeze uh, so-and-so's Bitcoin wallet. He's, he tweeted something mean about me. Can't do it. Bitcoin separates money from states. We've heard about the separation of church and state, but now we have the separation of money and state. <clears throat> And the core reality is when you separate money from state, what you're doing is separating money from humans. People can still raise their prices to unreasonable rates and do what they did in the temple under a Bitcoin standard. Yeah, you can still do that. I can say my book costs a million Satoshis, and then when you come to buy it, I, <laughs> by the way, anyone want to pay me a million Sats for my book today, I'll take it. But I could say that. And then when you come and say, actually, it's $2 million. I could still try to rip you off on the Bitcoin standard. I'm not saying a Bitcoin standard fixes everything. What I'm saying is it separates, I'm not saying it separates sin from people. Only Jesus does that. What I'm saying is Bitcoin separates the rules of money from the influence of sinful people. And encodes it in math. And math has never lied to me. Math is a great friend because it always tells me the truth. I don't know what they're teaching in public schools now. Maybe one plus one equals three now. I don't know. But we all know math is the great equalizer. <laughs> Pun intended. When you look at the totality of what scripture says about honest money and you layer that over the fiat system, it doesn't fit. It doesn't compute. But when you take the totality of scripture and what it says about honest money and layer it over Bitcoin, you see it fits. The policies of the Bitcoin network and the policies of God in honest money fits. And so when I look out at the landscape of our society, under this fiat standard, I can't help but become enraged myself. Why? We see the poor being exploited by the operators of the money printer. We see fraud and dishonesty propping up an entire banking sector. The bank is just a scam. You know that, right? It's just a scam. They, they, they don't hold your money. It's called fractional reserve banking because they only have a fraction of the reserve. It's a scam. 
We see societal rot, and maybe most egregiously, we see the value of human time and energy being completely debased and trampled on. No man should have to work his whole life, save, do what is right, then have his savings wiped out because a central bankster just fired up a money printer. I know people from South America who worked their whole life and saw their entire savings decimated. It wasn't their fault. It's because somebody at the bank said, fire up the printer, inflation time. So I believe this is the gospel issue because it's a love your neighbor issue. I'm not saying Bitcoin will save the world. Okay, It won't. Any good effect Bitcoin has on the future is only because it's aligned and riding on the back of God's universal truth of economic justice and honesty. And if that's true, and it is, how much more ought we to have our eyes on the real Savior, on Christ? I only, I only advocate Bitcoin as honest money because the teachings of my God and King align with it. That's all. People misunderstand me. They think, Alan, you're greedy. You're just trying to get rich. If Bitcoin goes to zero, I'm riding it to zero. Why? On principle. Because it's honest money. And let's face it, if Bitcoin goes to zero, it's only a matter of time before the dollar goes to zero. I'll just be broke quicker than you. <laughs> I'll see you in a few years probably in the gutter, so come join me. But I don't think that's going to happen. Christ is king, the supreme one, the supreme ruler, and he demands all men and women everywhere to repent, to turn from their sins, to bow the knee to him, to serve his kingdom. And all I'm saying to my Christian brethren is this. It's time to stop ignoring the big fat elephant in the room. It's time to stop ignoring him, or her, or they. I don't know how to, what pronouns this fiat elephant goes by. And it's time to start to look at Bitcoin as a real viable solution to this fiat problem. It's a ship that's sinking, and we all know it's sinking. We all know it's sinking. So when Jesus saw his neighbor being taken advantage of and robbed and stolen from, what did he do? He took action. Am I suggesting we march into the bank and start flipping tables? No. I mean, if you do, I'll record it and it'll go viral on Twitter. But don't do it. I'm not suggesting you do that. What I'm suggesting is we should take the theft of people's wealth as seriously as Jesus did. As seriously as God did. That's all I'm suggesting here. Instead of saying, well, we just live in a sinful world, what can be done? You know, it's too bad, but so sad. Instead, your heart ought to burn with the zeal Jesus' heart burned for the truth and move you to action to love your neighbor. And I wrestled with this question for years, man. I knew there was something broken about the money. I just didn't know what, what could you do. Like, I'm just one guy. What can I do? And then I learned about Bitcoin, and I said, wow, all I have to really do is just stack sacks and stay humble, and <laughs> that's it. It's a peaceful way to protest the fiat beast. It's just opt out. Use Bitcoin. May God arise, and may Christ be receiving the due worship he's owed. So that's it. That's all I got to say to you guys. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, if you haven't got a copy of my book, go grab one. And um, if you have gotten a copy of my book and you like it, buy more <laughs> and give it to all your Christian friends. Because, like I said, all I'm really interested in is getting this in front of the eyes of more Christian people and letting them make the decision for themselves. I just think a lot of the issue here is just ignorance. People just don't know. And the temperature's rising in the room. Everyone is, 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 is being um, confronted with this, this fiat system that it, everybody's feeling the crunch now almost. So I want, I want my brethren to know that there's an option here. There's something we can opt out that's morally and honestly viable. So that's it. Thanks for coming. Stick around. And... Get a bottle of water before they're gone. <laughs>
Bitcoin Well is a non-custodial Bitcoin platform in Canada and the USA. That means every single Satoshi you buy goes straight to your self-custody. They offer free withdrawals, a simple 1% spread, and they have the Bitcoin Wishing Well, where you can win up to a million Satoshis by earning points and throwing the coin in the well. In fact, you get five coin tosses to the Bitcoin Wishing Well when you sign up at bitcoinwell.com slash pastorcoin. Your family, your nation, and your world needs strong men. The devil wants men weak, emasculated, and addicted to porn. This is why I designed the Slaying the Beast course to help men take back the dominion porn stole from them. This course will help you discover your identity as God's image, how porn leverages and twists that against you, and how with God's help you can turn the tables on the beast and live free. There's also access to a Discord server where you can have fellowship with others in the fight. You do not have to wait any longer to conquer this beast once and for all. Go to lifegiverchurch.net to get started today.